Hey folks, in this video we're going to be talking about electrochemical impedance spectroscopy of a screen printed electrode biosensor. This is based off of EIS data submitted by you, the researcher, as part of an advanced EIS webinar series led by my colleague Neil Spinner. If you're interested in future webinars from Pine Research Instrumentation, go to pineresearch.com and stay tuned for more. This video is broken up into several sections. First, we're going to discuss the electrochemical system itself, the screen printed electrode biosensor and its different stages. We're then going to look directly at the EIS data, specifically looking at Nyquist plots that contain an inductive loop. We're then going to discuss what this inductive loop is, and then we're going to move into EIS circuit modeling of the system. Timestamps are in the description below. And lastly, before we begin, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Person submitted their data, and they were studying a sensor of a modified screen printed electrode or carbon screen printed electrode, so an SPE or SPCE. And the full disclosure, again, similar to the last data set, is that I've done my best to learn and read and represent appropriately this um, person's data, but I am not a, uh, an expert on biosensors by any means. Um, and so I will certainly just do my best to describe the process going on here. But if any of you do study sensors, you may certainly know more than I do about these kinds of processes or how they work. And as I understand it, this is used for detection of biomarkers for diseases is the field. And so there are four steps and five states where impedance was done. So the first state was just on the naked bare SPE. The first step was treatment with this compound, which is PABA or para-aminobenzoic acid with a chemical, electrochemical step. And the second, that leads to the second sort of stage, which is this PABA grafted carbon screen printed electrode. The next step, the second step is treatment with this EDC and NHS chemicals that creates the third stage, which is this carboxylic NHS ester grafted, or the word activated is used for this uh, stage of the electrode. The third step leading to the fourth stage is involves the attachment of a particular ligand, which I believe is essentially some kind of long chain nitrogenated hydrocarbon carbohydrate uh, some kind of um, organic material that is is the um, almost like the, the the fingerprint for the biomarker so you would you would attach a different ligand depending on what you're trying to sense uh, for for your different disease biomarker I believe and so now this is this activated grafted with a ligand and the final step that leads to the final stage where impedance was done is treatment with BSA, which uh, as I understand is uh, bovine serum albumin, which is some kind of protein that is used to, I believe, attach to active sites. And it actually blocks active sites on the electrode. Um, and that I believe in turn uh, improves the selectivity of the um, the biosensor. So the last stage is this activated ligand plus BSA. And so the reason this person submitted their data was again to try and uh, ask what circuit model uh, should be used to analyze the data. But the primary question was uh, with uh, respect to this inductive loop that was observed at high frequency. So I'm going to get into the data here. And what I'll do is I'll first show the first three steps because I'll just give away the answer that this high frequency inductive loop showed up and the last on four and five, the last two. So I will somewhat quickly go through the circuit fits for stages one through three. And I'm not gonna give too much analysis because I wanna try to focus on that high frequency inductive loop that um, was the interesting feature for this data. So the first, uh, naked SPE data, you see pretty standard kind of semicircle with a little bit of a diffusional tail, a, a little bit of um, drift going on for sure, probably just from some diffusion, uh, some uh, normal kinds of drift perhaps at low frequency. 
um, this fit is pretty standard. I can just increase this CPE and I get a decent fit. I could probably iterate this more and get a little bit of a better fit, maybe two Randall's elements, et cetera. But for, for, for these purposes now, this is, this is adequate. The PABA grafted data was mostly just a simple Randall's element. In fact, it just looks kind of like a single Randall's element. And then there was a little bit of noise at low frequency for sure. You see that the Kramer's Krona doesn't fit this portion too well. So I wouldn't expect a circuit fit to really fit the end very well either, but it just kind of looks like a simple uh, Randall's element, almost like one semicircle. And so this is probably good enough, honestly, for this fit. The third stage was a little more interesting, actually. The uh, graft activated with this NHS ester. You see a little bit of drift at low frequency, um, but for sure, uh, uh, more things are going on here. It looks like we kind of have one, two, three and a half Randall's elements. And so um, the circuit that I fit for this would be just that. I would have one, two, three Randall's elements with an extra CPE or Warburg, almost like Warburg element for diffusion. And so uh, the same kind of circuit fit can be done here where I lock all of the alpha values at one and do my calculation and then unlock them and probably need to increase the range for one of these. Yep, this one is hitting its maximum limit. So I'm gonna increase that range and get that, see if this fit will lock into place. And you can see that it looks pretty good. I could probably iterate a little again on this part. It's it's kind of not quite fitting. Also, this angle seems like it's a little bit too high. This needs to come down a little bit. I could probably decrease that 0.5, that alpha there. But anyway, for now, this is this is adequate. Um, and I'm going to get to the interesting data, if you will. So steps four and five, again, were the ones really of interest. And, on a large view, you see it kind of just looks like a semicircle with diffusion almost, basically, just something as simple as that. But when you zoom in, at the higher frequency, you see this loop. So some of you may be familiar with this kind of phenomenon, or you may have seen data like this, or you may have data this yourself, this loop here. So what's going on with this high frequency loop? So it's an unusual feature, and it can occur at high or low frequency. Um, this kind of a loop. Um, in this case, it's at high frequency. Uh, and, and, I, and I say it's unusual. And the reason is not because it's just a, I don't know, a strange looking thing. I say it's unusual because we, for the most part, I don't think anybody really knows why it happens. Um, and that to me is unusual. You know, you would think that people observing the same feature over and over again, someone would be able to find conclusive evidence. But that's, you know, the joy of science. Sometimes we don't always know. Uh, for sure. And so um, I've, I've kind of scanned literature and tried to find uh, as much information on this circuit as I can. And as best I can tell, these are some of the explanations that people have provided for such a loop or such an inductive feature. Is that something like a passive film formation, relaxation of species or transients, um, adsorption of species like oxygen or water, for example, like water uptake, water absorption, um, or things like corrosion or pitting. Uh, and that is typically seen at the lower frequencies. So perhaps, you know, maybe not at the higher frequencies. I'd expect that more at low frequency. During my five part webinar series, um, I discussed this phenomenon as well in this circuit, which is usually represented with this kind of three-tiered um, circuit that has almost like a Randall's element with an inductive um, and an inductor in it. And the value of this inductor is often meaningless. So I'm going to get into that as well and why I say that. So let me point out something about all impedance data for the most part first. And so if I look at this, um, this data here, and I, I sort of take a, a, a a step back, a wide view of my impedance data. And this is almost true for, for basically all impedance data. On my Nyquist plot, if I draw a line from the origin, from 0, 0 to any point, I have an x component, which is the z real, and a y component, which is the zi. The vector distance 
from the origin to any point is equivalent to the impedance magnitude. Now, now recall for a Nyquist plot, as I go from left to right, or I basically go along you know, the Nyquist plot, my frequency goes down. And what we see is that my impedance goes up. And so this is fairly universal for almost all um, a data sets you're going to get in impedance is the Nyquist plot goes this way, which just means as frequency goes down, impedance goes up. And this makes sense because almost every uh, uh, system involves capacitive elements or, or, or is, is dominated by a lot of capacitive elements, especially as the frequency drops. And so capacitors, as I mentioned previously, have an inverse relationship between impedance and frequency. So as a result, this behavior is pretty dominating. However, if I zoom in on this part with my inductive loops, I get a, you know, a, a different trend. And so looking at it through the lens of what I just mentioned in terms of the vector and that distance being my impedance magnitude, what I can see is that as I move along my Nyquist plot, I go from some value to a lower value. These points are getting closer to the origin, and then they get farther away. So for some period of time, I have the reverse trend. As the frequency drops, the impedance also drops. And then as the frequency continues to drop, it goes back up. And so the reason why you have to use an inductor is almost purely mathematical. It's not even really physical, it's mathematical. Because if you recall, again, as I've been saying, a capacitor, and even for that matter, a Warburg element, a Gerischer element, almost every element that you use to fit your data has the situation where as frequency goes down, impedance goes up. The only one that behaves differently is an inductor. An inductor has a direct relationship between frequency and impedance. As it goes down, impedance goes down. So that's why an inductor is is needed. And, and it's, it's interesting to me to think about this because almost all the time, and I've said this in my previous webinars, you want to try to use models that have physical meaning. Just like I did in the previous example, I, sh I showed Randall's elements applying to interfaces. Well, this is almost the exact opposite. I'm, I'm applying a model that doesn't necessarily have physical meaning. It's just an inductor to make this loop happen. But it, I'm doing it because I want to fit the rest of my data. I want to get a value for the you know, resistor and the capacitive element of the rest of my data. And so to do that, I have to fit this part. And so to do that, I need an inductor. So that's kind of a, a roundabout way of saying why I need to use this inductor. So now I'm going to try and fit this data and show you how that works. So essentially what I want is a leading resistor. And I want to make this sort of three-tiered element where I have my resistor and my capacitor or my CPE. And then I have my inductor and resistor in series. And then I have my, I have like a Randall's element with diffusion that's in series after that. So that's why this is a little bit of a tricky model because it's not just this, um, you know, this inductive loop kind of model. I also have that Randall's element and diffusional element coming after it. So it's it's a bit of a complicated model. And now what, what you'll find possibly when you do this fitting in software is that sometimes that loop can be kind of hard to fit. It doesn't always Software doesn't always um, do a, the best job at that. I'm gonna I'm gonna see if my my normal, you know, fitting alpha here will will get a, a decent fit on that loop. And right away you can see. Let's see if it got it. So it does seem to have captured that loop, which is quite fortunate. Um, it, it's not always the case where the loop will show up right away. Um, so that's 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 really pretty nice that the software was able to get that. And in the case where the software doesn't capture that loop, the most common thing you need to do is to adjust the ratio between your inductor and your CPE 
in that three tiered model. So this Q2 and this L2 or this L1 and this Q2, you can see that if I change that ratio, for example, I can make that loop kind of go away. So just the ratio of those two elements is what kind of determines what and how much of that loop um, you know, I'm going to have, basically. So, uh, but the, again, the, the main you know, benefit to this, this model is that I've got a fit for the rest of it. So I can you know, theoretically get a value for like the, the, the capacitance and the resistance of you know, uh, the rest of my, of my data. And that, that's, that has a lot of value to it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this fit and I'm going to apply it to number five as well to try and get that last data set and see if I can get a fit for that loop um, as well. And let's see if this can get a good fit. So it, it appears like it's it's not quite matching that CPE there. So I think what I probably need to do is adjust some of these parameters. One of these one of these CPEs is probably not quite you know right, or one of these resistors needs to be adjusted to get that behavior that I'm looking for. So that one doesn't seem to be the one. And if I mess with this one, that seems to get that behavior. See, now I'm getting kind of that shape that I want. So let, let's see if this kind of locks into place. Yeah, there we go. That seems a little better. And let's see if I zoom in. I want to make sure that loop is still here. So OK, that loop is here. But actually, the other thing is I see it's it's kind of there's a little bit of noise at high frequency in this data set. So I, I'm going to try unity fitting. Sometimes I just have a hunch. If you change unity or parametric, sometimes it'll be a little better, sometimes a little worse. I, I think that fits a little better. I would I would probably, you know, you could exclude the first maybe four or five points, possibly if those are just scatter. Um, but overall, I've, I've got that loop kind of behavior fit, and I've got the rest of the data fitting as well. So again, same sort of concept. Um, I'm, I'm just using this, this inductive element to be able to fit the data um, as accurately as possible. And then as a result, I should be able to get values for my you know, charge transfer resistance and my capacitance um, for uh, the biosensor. And uh, that's you know, a pretty useful, useful thing to be able to do. All right, folks, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon.